Hi, this is Michael Altos. We're continuing our discussion of induction agents and sedatives, and this is recording part three. The next IV anesthetic that we'll discuss is ketamine. Ketamine is different from the first several agents that we've discussed. It induces a form of dissociative amnesia. It dissociates the thalamus from the limbic cortex, leading to this cataleptic state. Patients experience profound amnesia and analgesia, but can maintain consciousness and protective reflexes at lower levels of drug. Ketamine is related to phencyclidine, which is PCP, and therefore one of the common side effects is hallucinations. It has both inhibitory and excitatory actions, and most important for you to know is that it is an NMDA antagonist. Ketamine is absorbed through IV or IM administration. It is a water-soluble preparation. It's rapidly taken up and redistributed. Biotransformation occurs in the liver, and some of the metabolites are active with high hepatic extraction. It's excreted finally in the urine. Ketamine can be used in many different ways. For analgesia, it can be used at low dose, say 0.1 to 0.5 milligrams per kilogram. As an induction dose for general anesthesia, we typically use 1 to 2 milligrams per kilogram IV, or 4 to 8 milligrams per kilogram if it's given intramuscular. It can also be mixed with a propofol infusion, for example, 1 milligram of ketamine per 10 milligrams of propofol, and other ratios are used as well. Ketamine's effects are different from the other drugs that we've discussed so far. It tends to cause tachycardia, an increase in blood pressure, and an increase in cardiac output, partially by inhibiting reuptake of norepinephrine. <coughs> Some people like to use ketamine in unstable patients instead of etomidate for these reasons. In the lungs, ketamine is a bronchodilator. It also increases salivation and has very minimal effect on ventilation. It increases cerebral metabolic oxygen consumption, increases cerebral blood flow, and increases intracranial pressure at higher doses. It's the second drug that we've discussed that enhances SSEP amplitude along with etomidate. As we mentioned, it causes hallucinations, and some patients report nightmares. But these side effects can be minimized by premedicating with benzodiazepines. Ketamine is an analgesic drug, and it's been used in the treatment of both acute and chronic pain. It does cause some amnesia. You may see some myoclonus with ketamine. And as I mentioned, ketamine infusions have been used for the treatment of chronic pain syndromes. They've also been used in treatment of some psychiatric disorders, including refractory depression. <clears throat> Moving on to the benzodiazepines. There are several different drugs in this category, and I'll just name a few so you can be familiar with them and recognize them if you see them um, in your patient's records. There's lorazepam, which is Ativan, diazepam, which is Valium, midazolam, which is Versed, and flumazenil, which we'll discuss in a moment, which is Romazicon. <clears throat> All of these benzodiazepines enhance GABA, which are inhibitory trans neurotransmitters, in the cerebral cortex. Some of them, like lorazepam and diazepam, are insoluble in water, and they're dissolved in propylene glycol, which can be somewhat irritating. But the one we use most commonly in anesthesia is midazolam, which is available in aqueous solution. It can be given by many different routes. Usually we give it IV, but it can be given intramuscular, orally, nasally, sublingually. It could be used as an IV dose for induction of general anesthesia, but this is a poor choice, probably because of the very large dose that you'll need to use and the slow recovery profile. Benzodiazepines do have a significant first-pass hepatic effect, which is another reason that we prefer to give them IV instead of orally. 
Benzodiazepines are moderately lipid soluble and they undergo rapid redistribution. They're also protein bound. The clinical onset of midazolam is about 30 to 60 seconds, although the peak effect may take about five minutes. So you should space your doses appropriately if you're trying to sedate somebody. And the duration of effect clinically is anywhere between 15 to 80 minutes. Benzodiazepines are biotransformed in the liver, specifically by the hepatic cytochrome P450 enzyme 3A4. Different benzodiazepines have different degrees of hepatic extraction. So diazepine, diazepam has a low hepatic extraction, a relatively long elimination half-life, and some active metabolites. So you'll see a prolonged clinical effect with this drug. Lorazepam has lower lipid solubility, so it's eliminated faster. And midazolam, which has a very high hepatic extraction, was probably eliminated the fastest. The drug is excreted in the urine. For midazolam, as a premedication, we'll use a dose of 0.04 to 0.08 milligrams per kilogram IV or IM, and about 10 times that much, 0.4 to 0.8 milligrams per kilogram, when given orally. Practically, in most adults, we see 2 milligrams as a starting dose, maybe 1 milligram in the elderly. But as you can see, we can go up from there if deeper sedation is required. As I said, you could use benzodiazepines to induce anesthesia at the very high dose of 0.1 to 0.3 milligrams per kilogram, but the recovery will be very slow and probably not done routinely. You can use benzodiazepine infusions, usually between 0.02 and 0.1 milligrams per kilogram per hour. And you're most likely to see this in the ICU and not routinely in the operating room. Most importantly, we should use less benzodiazepine in the elderly patients to the point where you would consider using little, like even half a milligram or perhaps none at all if it isn't absolutely necessary. Benzodiazepines cause very little effect in the cardiovascular system. At large doses, they will decrease your hypercapnic drive, especially together with other medications, but otherwise not a lot of respiratory effect either. In the brain, they do decrease cerebral metabolic oxygen consumption, cerebral blood flow, and intracranial pressure, but not as significantly as barbiturates, and you probably can't achieve burst suppression with benzodiazepines. They do cause anterograde amnesia, they're excellent drugs for anxiolysis, and benzodiazepines are anti-seizure medications. They may also cause some muscle relaxation, not to the point of paralysis, but may be useful in muscle spasm. Patients can definitely become dependent to benzodiazepines, and after reducing or stopping the dose, we can see both physical and psychological symptoms. Withdrawal from benzodiazepine may include symptoms like irritability, tremulousness or insomnia, and it can even be fatal if the, dependence is, if the dependence is high enough and the withdrawal is fast enough. Benzodiazepines exhibit synergy with other drugs, which means we see a magnified effect when the two drugs are combined. This happens with volatile anesthetics, opioids, ethanol, barbiturates, and other CNS depressants. One unique benzodiazepine is flumazenil. It is a benzodiazepine antagonist. It has a high affinity for the same receptor, but it has minimal activity. So it's a competitive antagonist. And this is the drug to use if you want to reverse or undo the effects of benzodiazepines. The dose is usually 0.01 milligrams per kilogram, up to a 0.2 milligram IV bolus. And you can give that IV bolus every minute up to about five doses, which is a milligram maximum dose. Now, the benzodiazepines may have a longer duration of action than the antagonist, and so patients may resedate as the flumazenil is metabolized. So you may need to redose your flumazenil every 20 minutes, depending on the patient's clinical condition. Can flumazenil be used to reverse inhalational anesthetics? It doesn't seem to be true, and 
nobody has shown an effect of, uh, of flumazenil on the MAC of volatile anesthetics. If a patient is chronically dependent on benzodiazepines, a dose of flumazenil can put them into withdrawal symptoms. The next sedative we'll discuss is dexmedetomidine, also called Presidex. This drug is a highly selective alpha-2 receptor agonist. We'll discuss alpha receptors later on this year when we talk about the autonomic nervous system. For now, you just need to know that similar to clonidine, it has specificity for the alpha-2 adrenergic receptor. It was most Originally, it was used as a drug for sedation of ventilated ICU patients, but since then, its role has expanded into the operating room and into the procedure suite for anxiolysis, um, for MAC anesthesia, as an adjuvant to anesthesia, and as a good sedation for awake intubations. <clears throat> Common dose is 0.2 to 0.7 micrograms per kilogram per hour. It does cause hypotension and bradycardia and should be used cautiously in patients who are at risk for those side effects. Very minimal respiratory effect. And neurologically, it causes a calm sedation, but the patient is easy to arouse and they can participate in certain parts of a procedure like taking a deep breath or closing their mouth or sticking out their tongue. It does cause some anxiolysis and some analgesia. At higher doses, it will reduce the MAC of your volatile anesthetics, perhaps by as much as 90%. It is expensive. I also just want to point out about dexmedetomidine that it does have a slower recovery profile than some of the other drugs we've discussed. So while it may be a good sedative, you may see patients requiring more time before they're ready for discharge from PACU. We'll stop there. Please let me know if you have questions about any of the material, and thanks again for your attention.